This is Start Up Storefront. Every culture has a food it's known for. In Japan, it's sushi. In Italy, it's pasta. And in Brazil, it's this famous Brazilian cheese bread. While sushi and pasta have long since made their way into every town in the United States, the same can't be said for Brazilian cheese bread. Recognizing this gap in the market, Junia decided to bring her favorite snack to America. And so she founded Brazi Bites. Initially, the growth was steady and predictable. But once they went on Shark Tank, Junia quite literally couldn't keep Brazi Bites on the shelves. In today's episode, we chat with Junia about selling out nationwide in a matter of a couple days after airing on Shark Tank, the challenges that come with inventing a new food category, and why her deal with Lori Greiner ended up pulling through once the cameras stopped rolling. All right, welcome to the podcast. On today's show, we're talking to Brazi Bites founder, Junia. Thanks for coming on. For people who don't know, what is Brazi Bites? What's the company do? So Brazi Bites is a frozen foods company, and we make Latin-inspired, better-for-you frozen foods. Um, we started the origin of the company, and the original mission was to bring Brazilian cheese bread to the U.S. market, which is a staple in Brazil and South America. Do kids, like, grow up with it? Is it something that's, like, on, on the breakfast table, dinner table? What's the origin of, of the food? So in Brazil, it's literally everywhere. So think about, like, how I try to explain this as almost like how chips are here in the U.S. Not sold similarly, but that present, you know. The cheese bread is, in Brazil, part of, like, it's ingrained in the culture. And it's in the freezer section, so you can cook at home like we make it here, but it's also in school cafeterias, in bakeries. You land at the airport in Brazil and there is a huge, like, just (laughs) cheese bread, like, you know, brick and mortar in your face. And it's really part of, like, the culture there and ingrained on how Brazilians live life in terms of, like, gatherings, right? You're always ready for a family member or neighbor to walk through the door, and so the cheese bread is kind of part of that. Got it. And then you come to America... You see it's missing, it's lacking, it doesn't exist. And then at some point you go, let's make it. And then you transition into saying, let's start a company. Was was the idea so clear to start a company? Or was it something like you can just make it for your, your family, your friends? The idea was kind of like this. I moved here and I've been here for like, you know, over five years working as a civil engineer, just day job, had graduated from college. And then I was really puzzled that this product wasn't here in a way that like Americans were enjoying because it was it's so popular in Brazil and South America. And then around that time, um, you might remember like Brazil had hosted the World Cup. How can we forget? Right, big yeah, moment. Huge. Um, subsequ- Didn't end well. On sad, sad ending. Yeah, sad. <laughs> sad ending. What happened at that time? So around that time, like hundreds of thousands of Americans descended to Brazil and experienced Brazilian culture. And I noticed that as also a pattern. I'm like, at that time, like, okay, this product's not here. It's incredible. It should be. And then I noticed wow. the love that Americans, how easily they connected with the product, right? Because sometimes you go to a foreign country and something is really foreign or right. something is like you something get you never it. had before, right? You get it. And yeah. so I start hearing like this sort of like, oh, one of my favorite things about Brazil was the cheese bread. That, that is time. such an interesting data point. Right. And then wow. at the same time, like all the things were like I got married and I had a, a wedding in Brazil and my husband is American. We had a bunch of friends go down there and then they're eating the cheese bread. Again, another data point. I'm like, OK, you know, oh my God. Americans are That's missing out on this. I am going to be the one to create a company and bring it. I think it's important to know I wasn't the first one to have this idea because sure. this idea is kind of obvious. If yeah. you're like, it's in your face. It's in your face. Yeah. And I had seen it in the U.S. in a very sort of underground, international way, approach, like in international sure, food corner stores, bakery. corner bakeries. Yeah. Like but you had to drive to a specific area of town. Totally. Yeah. And my idea was, no, I'm going to bring this to Americans in a way that Americans can understand. And I wanted it to be sold in mass groceries. So at Whole Foods, at Costco, Target, yeah. you know, Kroger. So from from the inception, the vision was to create a company with uh, sort of our way to introduce it. And so that's kind of the, the idea came about. And when they're coming into your wedding, are you, are you like, it's a Brazi bite. Like, are you saying that naturally or did you have to figure out some time to get the name of it? Like we would just say, that's the cheese bread, 
right? So it's very sort of like, just think about like, yeah, any type of, you're just trying to describe it, right? It's pão de queijo in Portuguese, which means just cheese bread. So oh, it's a cheese bread, cheese bread. Then over time, people are just falling in love with it, right? And so over time, we kind of created a brand around it and decided to launch the product in the CPG space and created the brand name Brazi Bites to sort of okay. honor the Bites from Brazil concept. What was your first step in deciding to go? Did you get like a prep kitchen? You knew you wanted to go and be, be in all these stores. And so what was like the first step that you took? The very first step was learning the ABCs of the food industry. So we took a class at a community college in Portland. Not CPG, but just food industry. Food industry, okay. just basic, okay. right? And so started learning how to package a recipe what it would take to do that. So there was a class in a community a college um, in our area. So Portland is a place that's very well set up for, there's a lot of like young food companies coming, emerging brands coming out of there because it's, there's a lot of infrastructure and support. So took this class, kind of understood the basics of it and then started, got a commercial kitchen, packaged it, started knocking on doors, tons of rejection, a couple yeses here and there and started to go. What was your first account? First account was um, a grocery store in Portland, very small, independent, called okay. Barber Road Foods. Amazing. So we'll always remember those guys. Yeah, yeah. and then and then at that time, so you're doing you're at one store, or are you just doing a bunch of the sampling? To bunch get people... of sampling. Okay. When you get a product in a grocery store that's brand new, so we created a category from scratch. When you're doing that, not only you have to sell in, but you have to promise to sell. And so our way was like, hey, give me the shelf space. I promise I'm coming this week and I will demo it and I'll sell everything. So all I'm asking you is to just say yes. It's no risk for you. Right. You know, you kind of do a little bit of like, hey, help me out here. I'll show you. Because- and where are they putting you in the store? Was that another issue? Because like fr- frozen bread isn't a thing everywhere. It's, it's a thing in some places. During COVID, it became a thing. But where are they putting you in the grocery store? So we created a category from scratch, and that happens a lot with new food products and beverage products. When you create a category, you have to kind of have clarity or at least a vision for where your product will go, right? When you're getting into retail, I always say this, you gotta deliver on a platter, the information to your buyer. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Obviously now I know this way better, right? After doing this for a decade. Yeah, but this is um, a good good takeaway. It's a good takeaway. You deliver, because sometimes we create a product and it's like, Oh, I'll ask my buyer where this goes. Well, the buyer is managing thousands of products. So you're telling them where to go. Telling them where you think at least with yep. confidence yep. and then have a conversation about it. Because our product is like cheese bread bites, it, it there's a number of places it can go in the store, it can go in frozen bread, it can go in frozen snacks. You know, there's there's a variety. We Our approach to this day, even as we build the category and we're in 17,000 stores nationwide, is to have a retailer specific approach. So we go, how do you merchandise your set? Where are the consumers going to find, go come looking for Brazzy Bites as a destination? And so we work hand in hand with the retailer. Is it always very different or are there some common, like I would, I'm just thinking out loud here, I have no idea, correct me if I'm wrong. Because you have the pepperoni bites, was that like a strategic move to put us next to the pepperoni bites? Or well, like the bagel bites or some of those things that exist on the market? So in, in the frozen space, the categories are a little bit more sort of like this. They a little bit more, more broad than you're speaking, but they okay. tend to be more like frozen snacks, frozen bread, frozen breakfast, you know, so they kind of like split that way. And the retailers will assign buyers for categories. If the retailer is massive, then they'll have multiple buyers throughout the freezer. Okay. If the retailer is small, there may be one or two buyers for the whole freezer set, so they overlap. For us, a lot of times, like the sort of like natural, better for you snacks is a good option for us. Because uh, it's gluten free, low calorie. Because we're better for you brand, right? Yeah, we're an yeah. all natural brand. We have all clean ingredients, no preservatives. So we do play in that space very well. Now, some retailers, I'll give you an example. We we work with Sprouts, right? Very um, well-known retailer in, in the sort of like the Arizona, California, and other parts of the country. They're natural foods retailers. So we are in snacks there. Oh, wow. So our product line is snack. It makes a ton of sense, right? They have a ton of uh, snacks there. At Whole Foods, we can often be found in bread and snacks. 
we are Costco. Guess what? Costco doesn't delineate, delineate categories, right? Sure, sure. You're at Costco and there's no signage, but you sort <laughs> of so navigate, true. right? Yeah. You're in the freezer, but you kind of navigate organically yeah. and you'll see our product there sort of near the snack bread area. Let's go back to the one store. So how did it go with the one store and how long were you just in one store super focused on proving the concept, I guess, and selling out? When we launched the company, you kind of ask about like, oh, did you want to be a you know, a bigger brand or you want to stay small. We did the math, right? So it was a math game. Running a company, running CPG is up is math, okay? So then you kind of start to realize how many units am, am I going to move on a, on a per store per week? Mm -hmm. It's a math around that concept. Super simple. Yeah. Very simple. Every category has a sort of an average sort of range. Yeah. And so then you do the number. How many doors do I have to be to make this company viable? Right. Right away. From what number? What number do you guys have in your head while you're doing the math? The first number that we did the math so that we say, okay, to ever like even get a paycheck or even get sniff close to a paycheck for us <laughs> founders, yeah. we have to be in 2,000 stores. To th which equals how much roughly revenue wise? Oh, I, I don't remember what our PNL was like at that time. Maybe like 500K in revenue or something along those lines. You know, it was under a million dollars, right? It was just a very small brand, but it, at the time, like the vision. Yeah. But it was uh, something like, okay, yeah, kind of maybe, maybe just like approaching a million. Okay. We felt like, okay, that's kind of bare minimum yep. to just viability. And you hear that a lot in the food industry. You got to kind of get to that sort of one, two, three, two, uh, even breathe, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, and so we kind of already had done the math and we knew there was a bit of a race. However, that race was a slow moving race because you have to get a door at a time. You have right. to learn the craft. Different salespeople, different, different, salespeople. different markets, different, and by the uh, way, which is crazy to me, by the way. That's the thing that when I think from a tech perspective that drives me crazy about CPG is the fact that like a buyer here is a very different buyer there. It could be the same company but there's so many different layers, so many different people. And so yes. it's like you, the repeatability of uh, uh, the scalability is way more difficult and way more personal than, yeah. than like tech, let's say, where it's like you buy, you can buy it, any buyer, it's the same thing. It's hard, it makes it so much harder. You have to, there's a lot of layers, there's a lot of people you have to navigate, right? And then as you get better at it, as you like, you're, you're, you're more confident in your selling store and your product begins to get traction, then you have start having access to those buyers that are gonna unlock much bigger doors, like yeah. you know, the Whole Foods of the world and even Sprouts and Costco and you know, eventually Walmart. But then it takes time to get there. Yeah, there's no easy way of doing it. Mm -hmm. What year did you get into the first store? 2011. Okay. Yeah, it was the first store. And then mm -hmm. at some point you decided to apply to Shark Tank. What was the idea of just trying to apply how well was the business doing before you applied? And what did, what value did you see? To some extent, 2015 Shark Tank, we could say is like early days of Shark Tank. So we had been in business for nearly five years, mm -hmm. right? Since launching the brand. And did you get funding prior? We got um, some very small seed. Okay. Uh, we were very bootstrapping, okay. very bootstrapper. We were um, very good at running a company and trying to figure out how to make our company successful we were not very good at raising money in okay. the early days sure that skill lagged That's for honest. us as, yeah. as founders it's it's hard it is hard it takes yeah. time but honestly that benefited us so what happened was we were laser focused on figuring out how to make brazi bites work as a company and then we developed that skill very well we didn't develop the let's raise money skill so it lagged but that was okay that turned out to be okay so in 2015, we had been in business about five years. We had been knocking on doors. We had about 600 doors. We had early traction. We had some regions of Whole Foods. We had gotten Sprouts, some Kroger. There was some really good signs that the brand really had the foundation to scale. But we also like were like, holy shit, it's been five years of working nonstop, like seven days a week. Like we were those founders with like no life. Whatever you took, this is pre-kids, like you're in it. You're just like going for it. So b bootstrapping, kind of going nuts with it. <laughs> <laughs> so we go and say, That's why okay. I cold plunge, by the way, just to remind myself of the torture of those days. It is, that's right? Why, that's why you, you got to remember those moments. You so have to, yeah. We go like, okay. We can see there's a lot of opportunity here, but we're going to run out of, out of gas because you can only do that for so long. And sometimes I tell people five years, they're like, oh, my God, like the Brazil Bite stores. It's like, guys, 
don't because people get scared I'm like am I gonna have to do this for five years not necessarily but sure. this was our story right then we go and say okay we love the show we're huge huge fans of the show we we felt like we had the qualities that the show likes right yeah. sort of like you have a husband and wife team you have an authentic product you have yeah. entrepreneurs who are giving their all and like bootstrapping and just building a category from scratch yeah. So we're like, okay, we're perfect for the show. And we kind of knew that. So it's so very hard to get on the show, it as is, you know. Yeah, yeah. Very competitive. But like everything, we put our best foot forward. We understood our place in their sort of like what they, the show was trying to do. Yeah. So we got on the show. And we knew it was going to be a huge break because we're like, okay, this cheese bread is incredible. We know people love it. The product is it. great. The product is fantastic. Yeah. So you what have, which have is developed. the hard part a lot of times. And so you're, you have an amazing product. And then when you went in, did you... Did you know exactly the number you guys, I know you said the number, but how long did you guys deliberate uh, deciding the $200,000 for 10%? Oh, we worked a ton, like tons of hours prepping for the show. I mean, it was nuts preparation. It was the biggest preparation of our lives at the time. Yeah. Hours upon hours upon hours. Like we went and watched every single show that had ever been recorded and would write, we would write down every question that was asked, the data and would ask our, ourselves back. So we were very smooth, very prepared for everything, including that ask. We, we were very clear on the ask. We wanted to be real and not be one of those entrepreneurs that go on the show and just ask for a ridiculous amount only to be like rejected and laughed at. We sure. Were, that's not our style. We're like, yeah. okay, what's... You're deliberate. Yeah what's, yeah, what's the reality of the situation, but make sure that we're being valued properly. And so did you know going in that they're going to, the, the ask of 200 for 10%, they would change it to 200 for 20%? Because based on the data, they do that every single time. Sometimes, I, I mean, we ended up like, I think our final offer from Kevin was 12%. So yeah. we ended up getting very close 12 and to, a half, yeah. 12 and a half, again, very close to the, our ask. So we weren't necessarily predicting it, but we had kind of like, okay, what's the max that we would go? You know, yep. it's so funny looking at the valuation at where the, our company is today. Oh, I believe that. Right, because yeah. we have like we are so much more and have evolved so much. So, but I love about your story on the show is you had you had three of the sharks going crazy for you guys. So they they bought into the product, they loved it, and then they're all just sort of competing with each other, which is kind of what you is, want when you go which on is the insane. show, right? Yeah, and, and I think so rare. When you were thinking about going on the show, was it clear that there was a shark you you guys really wanted to work with? Kinda. We really, we really like Mark because everybody likes Mark. Everybody likes Mark. And Mark, he, he follows a gluten free diet, so he's gluten free. Our product's gluten free, yeah. so we're like, okay, he's gonna get into it. But I also feel like Mark is very moody, and he's <laughs> <laughs> some days he, he was, was having just, a bad day. I don't know. Like some days it's like it's a long he, day of recording. Long day of recording where you go in, so it can be hit or miss with him. We um, we did like Lori. I mean. We, we had seen pros and cons to uh, most of them. Okay. And we just wanted, we wanted to get an investment. We wanted to have a good time. We wanted to get the exposure. Yep. So we just, we were open to it all. So you say no to Mr. Wonderful. You say no to Damon also. Yes. Who looked offended if you watched the show, which is kind of funny. <laughs> and, then, and then you end up striking a deal with Lori. Yes. And then what happens after the show? Do you guys close the deal? We had multiple offers, ended up shaking hands with Lori at the show. And then after the show, the deal did not close. Okay. Uh, both parties kind of um, decided to go part ways on the deal. You know, this happens a lot on the sh at the show. Yeah. More um, often than not, I think it, it happens. Yeah. More often well, than not. Was there a specific sticking point that she didn't like or that you guys didn't like? There was a couple of things that were major drivers. So when you get behind the scenes, because you're, you're at the show, you kind of have this broad kind of conversation about oh you know this is how much i sell this is my margin this is my product and so the offer is made there when you get behind the scenes you get into due diligence um you start going okay what what does this really look like and then we started doing due diligence on her as well we were very savvy to that and there was a couple of things on both sides on their side was the fact that they wanted to sort of prolong the ability to have that deal what do I mean by that? They, so they were wanted like, to see you hit certain targets before they make the investment? Investment. So they said, okay, oh, we, we, we will do the deal, but we want to do it in uh, 18 months. When I your think company that is was worth a, more money. And so it, it's and interesting. And I want the exact deal, but I want it in 18 months. And in the meantime, we were kind of like doing the diligence of like, okay, 
we knew we had had a great episode. Yeah. Like we knew the editing was going to be in our favor. Worst case scenario, you air for sure. We were likely going to air. Publicity is going to do. Yeah. Uh, production had told us we were going to air. We knew the episode had gone beautifully and it was going to be entertaining. So we had confidence in that. And then we we had a ton of traction. Like we were about to launch at Costco, like, you know, a couple weeks in. And so we didn't feel like it warranted. Like in 18 months, yeah, you're a different company. this company is totally different. What do you think her logic was there on the 18? Like, do you think she was thinking, okay, they'll air, they'll do a lot better, they'll launch at Costco? It just feels like a safety play, but do you, what do you think, think the logic? A, I think it's a total safety play. It's yeah. just having perhaps options on their plate and wanted to see every single thing hit the mark. And that's, right. you know, that's not how well, who doesn't we, want that. Right. <laughs> that's By so that perfect. time she would have made that investment. She would have had, had like a huge payback. Oh, yeah. It made no sense to us. And so, and then we, we were also really wanting, it's like, if you're going to take that much equity, if you're going to be holding hands with us. Yeah what's your experience in the food industry? And we we felt like the experience wasn't quite proven. I, I, I admire all the sharks. You know, I think that they're amazing at what they do. They're very successful. But the food industry, the CPG industry is very unique. Yeah. It requires a set of skills that not all investors have. Yeah. And so combined with that, we were like, you know what? Totally get why you want to extend a deal. That's your deal. Like we also feel like we really want a partner that's holding hands and just jumping with us like right yeah, now and knows married. our space. Yeah, totally. So like let's let's not do this. So we both kind of part ways in a friendly way. And you know, the show airs, the company goes from one to nearly ten million dollars in less than a year. What happens on air day for you guys in terms of sales? So Air Day was incredible. It was sort of like, I call it like life changing for us on Shark Tank. It was pre-streaming. Nine million people watched the show. We sold out nationwide. Um, we sold out nationwide. Sold out nationwide. So we just had Tia Lupita on who just aired. And what they said was they did their annual revenue. So the so last year's revenue, the total, they did that in three days. Yeah, um, I believe from it. The, from the air date to two days after. I believe it. Which, which is like, that's crazy it's crazy so what happens to us was like this we a frozen foods brand we were only in grocery stores so people i had never seen this happen and i haven't seen since with any food company especially in frozen people got in their cars and drove to the store mm. with such a sense of urgency to get the product from watching and try the show and try browsy bites like they had to have it they had to have it and so they ended up there was this frenzy that lasted almost six months Every time a bag would touch the freezer of a retailer, that bag was immediately sold. People would buy like at a rate, you know, normally a family will buy like two or three bags a week. They were buying like 12. They were cleaning the freezer. It was like I, scarcity like feeling. Wow. So there was this huge like momentum. But not only that, we flipped the way we ran the company. So up until that moment, I was like begging to get shelf space, right? I was telling my story. Literally the next day, I start getting emails from retailers and saying, can you come tell me about you? Come present to me. We had got into Costco before the show, and the timing was ridiculous in our favor in terms of luck. Because every entrepreneur's story has luck, right? This is a piece of luck for us. We had launched at Costco the week before we went on Shark Tank. They sold out a truckload of our products in like couple of days That's and they beautiful. called so perfect they called our office and they're like can i have 10 more of those and we're like <laughs> pallets know, we need pallets wow we want to just like truckloads and we, we obviously didn't have the capacity at that time but it was the beginning of an amazing relationship that to this day is very strong and important for the brand yeah that's amazing but it, it really gave us the exposure that we needed to like we knew we had something amazing right we hadn't created a great product we knew it made sense we had all the things but we didn't have the exposure, you know, until that moment to really scale and get to a much, like, amazing place that is that could take this brand to the next level. Did you guys end up raising capital on that exposure also? We sold so much product that we became highly profitable, wow, okay. highly profitable very quickly. Okay. Part of it because the brand also had no operating expenses because we were so small. <laughs> So it's kind of like it came to bite us a, a little bit down the road because we're like, oh, hey, now we're like this $15 million brand and we have four people running yeah. the company. <laughs> yeah. But that's why we were. And yeah. by the way, when you're selling that much and there's so much demand for your product, you don't need to promote. Right. 
So we ended up pro- canceling any promotions, like when you see s- sales at this grocery store level to get attention, to remind consumers you're there. Yeah. That wasn't needed, yeah. right? That was this frenzy. And so the company did very well. Like a few years later, we ended up raising money from private equity to really tr- take the brand to the you know the next stage, which okay. is kind of what we're doing today. Okay, so basically, but but for you guys, it was like a catalyst to get to probably like the acquisition point, and then you raise capital to sort of tighten everything up, uh, probably hire the right team or more people, COO from maybe a former food brand, something like that. Exactly. And really prime yourself for the acquisition. Exactly. To sort of like really organize the, the behind the scenes, the infrastructure of the brand to further scale. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. you can go on Shark Tank and really get that massive exposure. And so, but I think there's a kind of a breaking point in, in my space, in the CPG space, like when you get to about 15 million in revenue and you usually have achieved some sort of like, you have some following, you have relationships, you have some traction. There's a reason consumers are buying your product, but then you're going like, okay, what now? How do I take it from this point to the next level? And at that point for us, we had to kind of, okay, let's look at the infrastructure. Let's look at our innovation pipeline. Let's organize this and create a company that can scale. Yeah. How many SKUs are are you guys at today versus at that moment, um, let's say from Shark Tank to today? The biggest difference is we had one product line. So all we did was Brazilian cheese bread, right? We were laser focused on that, which was very good for the brand, very good for us. That's what we did. When after that, we said, okay, consumers want more from us. We, what can this brand deliver on? What, what makes us special? So we did a lot of branding work and look at like, you know, why people are buying, who was buying and, and how we were kind of being part of people's lives and, you know, became sort of created this foundation to become a Latin inspired, better for you platform. So after that, we launched mini empanadas. So we take the cheese bread and we fill with savory um, ingredients. Then that line evolved. So (laughs) that line evolved into our current pizza bite line, which is incredible. So out of the empanadas, we had a pizza flavor and that one took off. We're like, wait, hold on. There's something here. Yeah. So we pivot that into also uh, gluten free. uh, Everything always naturally gluten free. Yeah. And then we created breakfast sandwiches. Our consumers were coming to us and say, like, this is what we want next. And yeah. We're missing that in the freezer. And we actually have another innovation coming up this fall that I'm pretty excited about. Oh, what is it? I can't tell you. <laughs> You're going to have to follow us on social. It's okay. coming up. It's coming in August. We're, we're stoked. It's, it's going to unlock a lot of opportunity for the brand. So it's more about product lines, right? So it's a multiple, multiple product lines yeah. with the same sort of theme on what makes it special. Truly, when we looked, Diego, what makes our brand special is the, the deliciousness. Yeah. You know, yeah. we started looking, I was like, oh, it's actually not the fact that we're selling Brazilian cheese bread that's authentic, that's my culture. I love those things, and those things are behind the scenes on what makes us special. But we created a product that re- delivers on the delicious, and people are like, I just love this. And so we have a huge kid following, family following, gluten-free following. Yeah. And so it's multiple product lines around the same kind of foundation that makes the Brazil brand successful during the Shark Tank. Give me a window into the day-to-day for you now. I'm the CMO of the company. Yeah, so we, you got acquired, right? We didn't get fully acquired. So we, got, we did a private equity deal where there was a majority stake taken in the brand. During that time, we decided that I wanted to stay and continue to run the company. Congratulations, and, by the way. Still huge. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. You know, kind of for me, I wanted to see what the next thing was going to be like because yeah. I had you want to learn. You're curious. I want to learn. I'm like, yeah. what is this like? You know, being under private equity, what's it like to scale to these new heights? So I wanted to see what that was like. I moved from the CEO to the CMO role. We brought in a professional CEO that had run other CPG that has done a wonderful job. Is a great partner. My husband continued as the CEO. Really incredible at what he does as well. So the three of us are the leaders of the brand, uh, run the company, and with a team. You have amazing professionals because we wouldn't be able to like have scale without this incredible team. Yeah. We have a headquarters in Portland. So I, I go to the office most days. I run the marketing. So I run all the branding, the marketing, the consumer side. So like, I have a team of content creators. We are on TikTok. We're on Instagram. We are launching new products, I'm branding, I'm listening to the consumers. It's crazy to think about, so you started it in 2010 mm-hmm. when uh, the iPhone was new, 
re- relatively to the BlackBerry. Yeah. So social media is, is a thing, but it's not like as like it is today, which is crazy. And pre-streaming to your point on Shark Tank. Yeah. So then you go on Shark Tank and this is like the biggest moment in terms of eyeballs any brand could probably wish for delivers. And in that, after the Shark Tank appearance, you're now in a whole new world from a marketing perspective. Totally. Right? It's like now it's all video today. Mm-hmm. It's all TikTok. It's all Instagram. And, and really just like content all the time to, to grow your brand and to get product. And so how do you view marketing today? And like, what do you see as the levers for actual sales? So not just branding, but really just like, these are the things that we see working that people buy from. So seeing like in my lens, running this brand for the last 13 years, it's a constant evolution. I think it's they always be willing to evolve and be willing to drop what's not working mm-hmm. okay. you know so i you know hope had the the sort of like luck and sort of opportunity to work with amazing agencies especially on the marketing side over the last few years after the company kind of became bigger and i am very quick to like keep my agencies on their toes you know even these incredible big agencies and the moment i'm seeing something is not working i'm having those honest conversations and going like guys like you're not doing it. So recently I moved, I, I just did a pivot like six months ago where I moved all the content creation in-house again. And I've had like content creation outsource. I've had in-house, I've gone back and forth. I'm like, this is, doesn't work. Like it's too fast. It requires too much like volume mm-hmm. and quality mm-hmm. that I'm outsourcing not, is outsourcing tough. is not working. Yeah. So that's a very recent pivot that I'm like, you know, I love my partners, but I'm coming in in-house. So I brought more creators in-house. I'm really working to elevate all their skill sets and we are just on top of it. You know, we're constant on yeah. trying to break through like TikTok and Instagram. And look, those platforms are changing every week themselves. Yeah, so, so true. you have to stay on it's top hard. of it yeah. and constantly be open to like, okay, that's not working. Fine, let's go. You know, let's move. And so what makes something successful today? I think for my space, I'm focusing on a couple of things. One is this piece on like the content creation and reaching consumers and being discovered is a big priority for us and my team there. But the second one in my space, because I'm a frozen foods company and I am primarily sold through the retail channel, is really understanding what's going on with each individual retailer that we're working with, partnering with them, and that and, and sort of marketing according to their needs. Mm-hmm. That has always worked and it, it continues to be very important because you can go out and blow up your content creation, this and that. But if I don't understand how Whole Foods, what's going on inside Whole Foods right now, what the changes they are making, what are the levers that are working for them, post Amazon, like all that stuff, then I'm going to have all this cool buzz on TikTok, but then I'm going to fail in my relationship with Whole Foods. I may yeah. lose my shelf space. That's not going to work. Right. So it's having to maintain this That's sort smart. of two fronts, right? My background helps the brand in that regard because I ran sales for 10 years. I thought you, I thought you were going to say your civil engineering background. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, tell me how that but helps. Before we were able to build a team, I was kind of the marketing and sales person, yeah. right? Yeah. As a founder, usually in the beginning, a founder takes a sales hat. Yeah. So I did sales. So I got very intimate on like what drives the buyers, the retailers. So I'm constantly working with my sales directors, very close to like, what are these accounts need? How do we leverage? I'm, I'm sort of this balancing person that I'm like with my creative team doing all the social stuff and then trying to support sales to continue to strain these partnerships with retailers. So those two things are hugely important for us. Yeah. So I'll give you an example. This product that we're launching in, in August. August <laughs> that I shall not name names, but I'll say it's very cheesy and it's awesome. Okay. We have a bunch of content that we're kind of starting to pre-build for it, but none of it would work if we hadn't had this one big retailer partner who looked at this idea okay. Okay. like months ago and we, we were showing them and, and they were like, that's right. Oh, I, okay. I want that. I got it. And then we said, okay, cool. What does that mean? Like, to I you. want that right. to us. To your brand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They, okay. We show them at a, at a trade show and say, hey, this is where we're going. This is our next innovation. They said, oh, I want that. I want to be first with that. And I want to be your partner with that. Okay, cool. Let's build. So then we created this innovation. We started doing all the things to bring it to market, holding hands with them. Now in August, when social comes live, it's out there. 
in a way that a lot of people, like half of the country, can have access to it. So otherwise, you know, I have to be very mindful frozen. That's smart. Very mindful frozen. So it's, you know, balancing those things, constantly evolving. This industry is nuts, man. It's just interesting because I think about it like, like for me, uh, you know, I think at some point probably this year we'll launch a CPG company of some kind. When I think about it, it's, o it's always like there's two ways of looking at it. You can look at it as what's missing into the world, mm -hmm. which is, I think, how n entrepreneurs operate usually. What, what, is the world, what do I think the world needs? And then there's the lens of what do the retailers need? What is the space in the retailer world, which is a completely different set of operating principles? And, and can I address a need for them? And if so to what you're doing now with the content side. Can I marry content to facilitate that need, which is gonna bring them revenue and then you revenue? So it's like a, it's a, like, like a next level way of thinking. Yes. Uh, which is super intelligent. And I, I think you have to be really mindful of your category. Yeah. Really mindful. So like there's so many things in the beverage space that work beautifully, both on the content and retail partnership that won't work on the perishable side. Like if I'm frozen, if I, but, you know, Frozen has a great, great play at it, which is shelf stable, right? We have like one year shelf life, so we can scale this thing yeah. a lot. And then you have other products where the shelf life is a week. So you have to be really mindful of your category and see about how you're going to deploy those things. You can do social content all day long and really blow up. But if people can get your products or if you're not, you know, the access and the price is not right. So yeah. it's a balance That's to true. find that sort of sweet spot. I want to talk about your fund. You just launched some a fund. You had your first recipient. Tell tell the world about it. So last year we launched the. It was an, It's an accelerator. It's called the Latino Entrepreneur Accelerator Program. We launched that because I wanted to give back and and share the lessons. I I love sharing like all the, you know, the trials and tribulations and the obstacles in the food industry and help people. Um, and I wanted to take this as an opportunity to uplift and support minority leaders in CPG as a Latina myself. And so we created the accelerator program and what it entailed was the winner would get there's ten thousand dollars in just, you know, cold hard cash that they could deploy at their their need. And then most importantly, a lot of mentorship from my team and my partners. And so it it was an amazing experience. It had we had, you know, nearly 100 submissions, tons of, like, it was incredible. And it was very, like, restricted to the Latino founder and a certain revenue that was kind of really early stages because mm -hmm. we wanted to see. I felt like, you know, based on my experience, when you're under a million in revenue, nobody gives you the time of day. Yeah, it's, hard. it's really hard. It's like, oh, you know, keep grinding, come back another time. So I'm like... <laughs> yeah. That's what happened to us until, yeah. we, you know, we kind of reached that scale and got, were able to, okay, now, now you're listening. Now I have something here. And so I was like, okay, can I help and kind of give back on, on what I had learned to be true? Yeah. And so we, re, we kind of restricted that and, and had an amazing program. So the, call it like the first 1.0, the first time went live and the entrepreneur was very happy with it, has already got into Whole Foods with, you know, nice. our support and our guidance. Wow. And is it in person or how do you how do you structure that? Like the mentorship portion of it, is it? So the mentorship took place over 12 weeks and we met with the founder and customized it for their needs. It was like, what are your needs? And then we assign people from my company and my partners. So like I have a lot of agency partners and a lot of, you know, support team in addition to the people that work at Brazzy Bites. And so if the need was like legal, and I was like, okay, my attorney, then they donated time. If the need was like, let's look at your branding, then my branding agency, you know, which was cool to be in a place where we have those partnerships that are strong enough with those high caliber people. And my team was so stoked. Everybody in our company was so like excited to help and kind of became its own like team building that benefited internally and externally. So it was an amazing program. We just wrapped up the mentorship and we're gonna do it again. We're gonna do it again. Amazing. We're kind of organizing it to launch again in September, which is Latin okay. Heritage Month. Where can people find it? Go to brazibytes.com okay. for now. Uh, sign up to be a subscriber. You can follow us on Instagram. We'll be posting that when we're open for entries um, as it like Latin Heritage in Month September. Approach. So around September time frame. Right after your new product launch in August. I got a lot going on. I got a lot going on. <laughs> yeah, the team was like, oh, you know, we're, it looks like it's a go-to market on in August with this product. I was like, and there's Latin and Heritage there's Latin Month. Heritage Month yeah. Right, let's go, you know. I love it. We just get pumped. Like the more, yeah. you know, 
it's fun. Well, thanks for coming on the podcast, sharing your story. I Thank appreciate you so it. much. If you made it this far, I bet you loved the episode. So you should join our YouTube channel membership for only $2.99 a month. This gets you access to one, the whole unabridged conversation. Two, you get the episodes on Monday, one day earlier. Three, you get two additional entries to our giveaways. Check out our Instagram to see what we've given away. And four, you get access to seasons one through three. That's over 100 episodes of wisdom and life-changing advice. What are you waiting for? Join.